Hello, welcome to the first lecture in Bio 3465, Tropical Forest Ecology and Use. And the lecture is called What and Where Are the Tropics? So in this lecture, hopefully I will extend your knowledge, which you have gained from high school and other places and other courses, um, to give you a good definition of what the tropics are. And as you know, the tropics are the focus of this course. Um, we look at the tropical rainforests, and rainforests are basically found in the tropics, except for temperate rainforests, um, but we're not going to go into those. We're looking at tropical rainforest ecology. So in this lecture, I want to take a look at the definitions of the tropics. What are the tropics? Where are the tropics? And I want to take a look at some of the abiotic characteristics of the tropics temperature, rainfall, the winds that you find in the tropics. Um, I'm not too sure I'll do humidity and evaporation actually. I don't think I will do that. Let me take that out one time. And finally, relief and climate. So the first thing, where, where are the tropics or what are the tropics? Basically, the tropics are the area of the Earth, of the surface of the Earth, which lies between 23 and a third degrees north and south of the equator. And that's a strange name, 23 and a third degrees north and south of the equator. Why choose that number? Was it just some sort of political decision which was made in a conference some time just to decide, okay, let's define the tropics? as 23 and a third degrees north and south of the equator? Actually, it wasn't. It is actually a natural boundary. It is the north and south limits of where the sun is directly overhead. So directly overhead, we mean perpendicular above you in the sky. So the sun's energy will come directly down to the ground and that means a couple of things. First of all, it means that there is the maximum amount of solar energy per unit area. And secondly, that solar energy has the least amount of atmosphere to travel through. And I'll talk more about that in detail later on. So it's the north and south limits of where the sun is directly overhead. So in the north, around the tropic line, which is called the Tropic of Cancer, which runs just to the south of Florida and to the north of uh, Cuba um, around the world and it the Sun is directly overhead at that tropic line around June 21st so the summer solstice and the Sun is directly overhead around December 21st at the other tropic line, the Tropic of Capricorn, which runs through the middle of Australia and through um, southern Brazil and the countries of South America down that side. So the sun is directly overhead at some point of the year, because the sun, as you know, will be directly overhead at different points at different times of the year. The tropics make up about half the surface of the Earth, and that's a fairly large area. So it's a fairly important region. So why is it important that the sun is directly over it? Okay, no, first of all, let's talk a little bit about 23 and a third, 23 and a half degrees north and south of the equator. Why? 23 and a, a half. Well, it's all to do with the axial tilt of the Earth. As you know, the Earth is a sphere which is rotating, and that's why we get day and night. The uh, axis of rotation of the Earth uh, is tilted from the vertical, and by some strange coincidence, that tilt is actually 23 and a half degrees. Actually, it's no coincidence, really. Uh, because of that tilt, that means that uh, is where the sun must be directly overhead. Okay? 
23 and a third degrees north of the equator, which is zero uh, degrees, which is the middle of the Earth's uh, axis of rotation. Okay. So at um, some point in time, the sun is directly overhead. Why is that important? It's important for two reasons. Um, both of those reasons are abiotic. It heavily influences the abiotic characteristics of the tropics, that sun being overhead. And the first abiotic characteristic is temperature. So because the sun is directly overhead, and moreover, even when it is not directly overhead, it is still high enough in the sky. So even at, um, in the Tropic of Cancer, when the, in December, when the sun is all the way down south over the Tropic of Capricorn, the sun is still high enough in the sky to um, provide enough solar radiation energy to maintain the temperature. Okay? The temperature is slightly lower than uh, the average annual temperature and, and much lower than the maximum temperature uh, that is experienced, um, but it is still high enough that there is, for instance, no frost during the night, um, particularly at the, on the coast. So that has a big impact on the type of vegetation which can occur in these areas. Okay, so because the sun is always uh, at a high elevation in the sky and at overhead during one part of the year, the temperatures are generally always high. So more solar radiation per unit area compared to temperate regions. That's why one of the reasons why the temperature tends to be all, always high. Also. Um, okay, more, so, more solar radiation per temp, uh, unit area, and this diagram illustrates that. So if we take the width of this sunbeam, um, which is constant at the equator and in the temperate regions, and we look at the area that it shines upon, the area is obviously much smaller at the equator, and it's stretched over a much wider area in the temperate regions. So that means that the amount of energy per unit area is much greater at the equator and it is much lower in the temperate regions because it's stretched over a wider area. And that means that obviously the temperature will be higher in the equatorial regions than in the temperate regions. So that's one reason why temperature does tend to be higher or more constant in uh, the tropics and in fact the temperature does tend to be uh, very constant across the tropics and how constant we will see in a minute. All right, so there's that diagram and here's a picture of the Earth. Um, I, I need to take that picture out, it's not, it doesn't really do much. This one shows you where the tropic lines are. Okay, here is the equator which runs around the maximum circumference of the Earth. Okay, so the middle of the Earth. Um, here is the Tropic of Capricorn in the south. As you can see, it goes through southern Brazil, northern Argentina, southern part of Africa, through the middle of Australia, and so on. And Tropic of Cancer runs through Mexico, just south of Florida, north of Cuba, through the middle of the Sahara Desert, the middle of the deserts of the uh, Arabian Peninsula, India, and so on, and into the Pacific. Okay, and all the area between those two tropic lines is known as the tropics. Trinidad is right there, as you already know. So, as you can see, we're right in the middle of the tropics. Okay, another reason why temperature is fairly constant and quite high um, is not only because there is uh, more 
rainfall, sorry, more <laughs> energy per unit area, but also because the energy has less atmosphere to travel through. Okay? Less atmosphere to travel through um, means that the energy is less attenuated by the time it reaches the surface of the Earth. So these two factors, the higher energy per unit area and the less amount of atmosphere to travel through combine uh, to mean that the sun uh, when you feel it and perceive it on the ground in the tropics tends to be much more powerful much more energy so plants would also receive much higher amounts of um, photosynthetically active radiation for instance in the tropics compared to the temperate regions. In the temperate regions, if you've ever been up there, particularly during winter, you'll note that the sun never gets too high above the horizon. And even if you are standing in the sun on a bright sunny day in winter, the energy that you feel from the sun seems very weak and watery. And that is because most of the energy is, well, what energy does get through is spread over a much wider area, but also that energy is spread, is, um, has to travel through a great thickness of atmosphere, which will absorb energy in the, particularly water molecules, uh, but also in other molecules like uh, carbon dioxide and so on, as it travels through, okay, and uh, before it hits the surface of the Earth. So the sunlight in the temperate regions, particularly in winter, will feel very much attenuated, much weaker than the sun that you would get in the tropics. It's interesting to note, however, okay, um, that down here, uh, temperatures will tend to be higher in the tropic regions close to the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer. So the highest temperatures that you get in the tropics will tend not to be at the equator, but instead will tend to be around the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer. Now the reason for that is the interaction of the energy with clouds. Okay? At the equator, the energy is always high enough to evaporate enough water to form clouds. During the dry season, during the um, winter at the tropic regions, there simply isn't enough energy to evaporate enough water to form clouds. So the sun shines directly down on the surface. So the amount of energy is not attenuated by clouds and reflected back out into space. Instead, it all impacts on the ground. So cloudiness also has a big impact on the temperature which is experienced. So once the amount of energy gets above a certain level, evaporation will take over and form clouds which will protect the temperature from going any higher. But if you don't have enough energy, the temperature will continue to rise uh, because there are no uh, clouds formed. Okay, So that means that the highest temperatures that you get in the tropics tend to be near the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer. And as we will see, those are the areas which would tend to have also the driest parts of the tropics. Okay, so temperature in the tropics, um, to put it into some sort of mathematical um, context, monthly average temperatures uh, in the tropics differ by less than 5 degrees cent centigrade. So the um, monthly average temperature in December is within 5 degrees of the monthly average temperature in uh, June uh, anywhere in the tropics. So that means that the temperatures are essentially very constant. Okay?
Generally, the dry tropics have higher temperatures and the rainforests have lower due to cloudiness, as I explained just now. And <clears throat> below 10 degrees north and south of the equator, so in that band around the equator, the wet season tends to be the coolest month because that's when the clouds are most prevalent and that's when the solar radiation is blocked the most. When you get above 10 degrees north and south latitude, um, the spread of the radiation um, takes over as the dominant controlling factor on temperature and above 10 degrees north and south of the equator the winter or the dry season tends to be cooler than the other parts of the year okay so in Trinidad we're right on that boundary um, so really what happens is that um, when we get periods where there is lower rainfall uh, particularly outside of those winter months of December to um, February they tend to be the hottest parts of the year and that, that would be around September and so when we have the petty creme and so on okay I like asking this question about uh, which is the wetter uh, the hottest and coolest month uh, in the tropics in uh, different parts of the tropics that's a nice question to ask. Okay, so just to emphasize that temperature in the tropics tends to be very constant throughout the year. If you contrast that with, say, Toronto, Canada, the temperature ranges very widely over the course of the year. Okay, this diagram actually. Um, is a good introduction to the next abiotic factor which I want to explore for the tropics and that's rainfall. Okay, In Toronto you can see that the rainfall tends to be relatively constant throughout the year. It's at a fairly low level but because the temperatures tend to be much lower that means that the evaporative load on vegetation tends to be lower and that means that you can get broadleaf deciduous trees uh, in Toronto in Canada. The rainfall tends to be much higher in uh, this is in the Amazon basin in Belém in Brazil. Uh, temperature is higher and much more constant. The rainfall is much higher also um, but it is much more variable. You see during the course of the year the rainfall peaks and then falls and this is um, a reflection of the passage of the sun okay because rainfall in the tropics is very much dependent on where the sun is in the sky if it's directly overhead there tends to be more rainfall if it's further away in other words it's taking its uh, winter holidays down in the southern hemisphere then there will be less rainfall and that's reflected in most places in the tropics it's only when you get within five degrees north and south of the equator that you will tend to see or start to see a much more constant supply of rainfall because the sun is never too far away from the vertical um, or being above uh, within that, in that band five degrees north and south of the equator. Um, this is uh, another diagram. I have an uh, issue with this diagram. This is from the textbook. Uh, this is in Darwin, Australia. So Darwin, Australia is just here. And this one is Singapore, which is just here. Singapore is pretty much on the equator. Darwin is quite close to the Tropic of Capricorn. So temperature is this line here temperature is this line here as you can t see temperature pretty much constant throughout the year for both Darwin and both and also Singapore and it's pretty much the same despite the fact that Singapore is on the equator and Darwin is almost on the Tropic of um, Capricorn so 
temperature constant and pretty much the same throughout the year uh, within the tropics. What is different, of course, is the rainfall. Um, yeah, I told you I had a problem with this diagram, and that problem is that they've shown that the rainfall peaks in June, July, but that's actually the austral winter. The um, rainfall actually peaks during uh, January, February, March, during the austral summer. So this diagram should be more like this. Yeah rather than this so it's seasonally inaccurate but the shape of it is correct you would tend to get very low rainfall during the winter and very high rainfall during the summer when the sun is directly overhead and here the sun is taking its northern hemisphere holiday so it's up in above the tropic of cancer and a long way from the tropic of capricorn okay so rainfall varies quite strongly in the tropics. Okay? Temperature, very constant. Rainfall is the abiotic factor which changes the most. And if you've ever traveled around the tropics, you'll see that the vegetation communities do change in different parts of the tropics, from tropical rainforests around the equator through tropical deciduous forests and tropical savannas um, as you head further north and finally tropical deserts when you get up around the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer. Now since temperature is pretty much constant throughout the tropics it's not the temperature which is doing this instead it is the rainfall. Rainfall varies quite widely across the tropics and during the course of the year uh, as you can see here okay Singapore on the equator constant rainfall Darwin on the tropic very seasonal rainfall okay it's the total amount of rainfall tends to be lower at the tropics so it's about 1600 millimeters here in Darwin whereas in Singapore it's up around 2500 millimeters average annual rainfall. So the rainfall amount and seasonality vary strongly across the tropics and that is what influences the type of ecosystems and the occurrence of tropical rainforests in the different parts of the tropics. Okay, And the reason for that is the type of rainfall uh, which falls in the tropics and that is typically convectional rainfall. You've probably heard of convectional rainfall. Um, that is rainfall which requires huge amounts of energy to occur. So what convectional rainfall is essentially is uh, the sun's solar energy heating up water uh, both in open water bodies but also evaporating it from vegetation uh, through transpiration as well. Um, so that it uh, rises, turns into water vapor, rises up into the atmosphere and because that energy is so intense more and more of that water is pumped into the atmosphere very quickly so that it pushes the, uh, the moisture higher and higher into the atmosphere and as you know the higher you get into the atmosphere the cooler it gets okay because as you uh, an air uh, mass rises in the atmosphere there is less atmosphere above it because there's less atmosphere above it the pressure on that air mass gets less and less so as it rises the pressure on it gets less and less and it begins to expand and as it expands it cools okay and that's basic physics if you reduce the pressure on an air mass it will expand and cool if you increase the pressure on an air mass it will uh, shrink and get hotter okay so our air mass uh, heats is heated up at ground level 
and so rises and then is pushed further up um, by the air being heated up and rising underneath it. So this, um, given the right conditions, this system is very efficient and large amounts of moisture can be pushed into the, up, the higher up in the atmosphere very quickly. Okay, And cumulus clouds are formed. Now cumulus clouds are basically um, that moisture vapor which was evaporated from the surface um, condensing around dust particles in the atmosphere and forming liquid water droplets which we see as clouds. Now the greater the amount of water the more um, and the higher it goes in the atmosphere that water droplet gets bigger and bigger until eventually it's simply too big for that upward movement of air to support it. And once it gets too big, and the millions of droplets around it get too big, they start to fall. Okay? And that momentum that they gain when they fall just continues and carries them all the way down to Earth. Okay? And we perceive that falling of that condensed water around a water droplet as rain. Okay? And this can be a very efficient system which evaporates hundreds of thousands of tons of water into the atmosphere okay over the course of a few hours up into the atmosphere and then it is just dumped back down as rainfall okay this system this convectional rainfall requires huge amounts of energy though so it can only occur when the sun is not just directly overhead but close enough to directly overhead within maybe five degrees of vertically overhead okay once it is lower than that the amount of energy is spread too thinly across the surface of the earth and the energy has to travel to, through too much atmosphere so the energy isn't enough to drive a strong convectional rainfall system Okay, so that is why rainfall, this convectional rainfall, which is the main form of rainfall in the tropics, only occurs when the sun is within five degrees of being directly overhead and at other times of the year there simply isn't enough energy for convectional rainfall to be driven and we perceive that as a dry season, the dry season. Okay? So the rainfall will fall in very intense events. Okay? Fairly brief compared to rainfall and so on. So because of that and the rainfall following the course of the sun, the seasonality of rainfall will increase away from the equator. So seasonality, the length of the dry season, the partitioning of rainfall into one part of the year will increase as you move away from the equator. The equator and five degrees north and south of the equator, okay, is never too far, well, the sun is never too far away from being overhead to provide enough energy for convectional rainfall. So rainfall will always, convectional rainfall will always occur throughout the year around the equator. But as you move away from the equator, there will be periods of the year and that period of the year will get greater and greater as you move away from the equator to the north or to the south uh, where the sun is simply not um, high enough in the sky to drive convectional rainfall. So seasonality of rainfall, or the length of the dry season, increases as you move away from the equator towards the tropics. Okay, So by the time you reach the tropics, the seasonality is at, at its maximum, and you may only get rainfall for about three, four, maybe five months of the year, 
when the sun is high enough in the sky to drive the convectional rainfall. Okay, In rainforest areas, or areas where you get rainforest, rainfall needs to occur throughout the year. Okay, So all those trees which form a rainforest um, with their green leaves and they transpiring and need that water to transpire throughout the year so they can keep their stomata open so they can photosynthesize they need a constant supply of water if they don't get that constant supply of water for more than 10 months for less than 10 months of the year if they don't get um, constant supply of water for at least 10 months of the year they will start to lose primary productivity. They won't be able to rely on the soil stocks of water for those dry periods. That'll all be exhausted. So they will run out of water. And the first response when they run out of water is to drop the leaves to reduce the transpiration load. So um, tropical rainforests are found mainly where the rainfall is constant and that's within five degrees to ten degrees north and south of the equator okay they tend they tend to tropical rainforests tend to um, go further north and south um, on the eastern sides of continents on the eastern sides of islands um, as we will see later on and I'll explain why that is when we look at winds in the tropics wind in the tropics the trade winds in particular once you get north of 10 degrees uh, north and south of the equator you start to get tropical dry forest and tropical savanna in fact once you get further north and trop and five degrees north and south of the equator you will tend to get tropical dry forest and tropical savanna and that occurs over pretty much the remainder of the tropics okay and you would tend to find areas of desert around tropics the tropics of capricorn and cancer okay so the tropical dry forest occurs when there is uh, seasonal rainfall there is maybe three so three to six months of the year where you would tend to get uh, not enough rainfall to recharge the soil moisture so the trees basically run out of um, rainfall okay tropical savannas occupy pretty much the same um, seasonal area as a tropical dry forest and as i'll talk about in the next lecture the main difference and the main reason why you would get a tropical dry forest uh, rather than a tropical savanna has more to do with the occurrence of fire than it does uh, to do with differences in the seasonal rainfall okay so tropical dry forest and tropical savanna tend to be found in the same uh, abiotic conditions the same seasonality of rainfall the same amount of rainfall and it's only with the intensity of fire or the incidence of fire that you would find a difference between those ecosystems deserts tend to be found around the tropics of capricorn and cancer particularly on the middle and western margins of continents okay and the reason for that again is the trade winds and the deflection of winds in the tropics and i'll talk more about that in a minute okay now these two um features these two abiotic parameters temperature and total annual precipitation have been used to predict what sort of ecosystems or biomes you would get in a particular locality. So if you can uh, predict or say what the temperature range and temperature is going to be like in a particular location and you also know the mean annual precipitation then you can predict the type of biome that you would get, whether it be a rainforest, a dry forest, a savanna, 
a desert, um, a temperate forest, uh, a conifer forest or the tundra for instance. And there have been a number of different systems um, erected using uh, temperature and precipitation to predict, predict um, these different uh, what sort of ecosystem type you would find. And this um, has pleased um, geographers for many years. A system which currently is used a lot is the Holdridge system which was erected in 1946. Okay. Um, it used a uh, parameter called mean annual bio temperature which was basically mean annual temperature above freezing for the course of the year so you would take out the uh, temperatures below freezing and the total annual precipitation and then a ratio of potential evapotranspiration to mean annual precipitation so potential evapo mean potential evapotranspiration has, uh, is a figure which can be calculated uh, from the uh, temperature okay and modified um, to include the amount of uh, precipitation okay so using these figures uh, a diagram can be drawn with uh, potential evapotranspiration ratio and annual precipitation and that can be used and plotted against different humidity provinces okay, to give you different types of ecosystem. Okay, So in an area where there is high rainfall okay, and very low potential evapotranspiration okay, you will tend to find rainforests. Okay, So this potential evapotranspiration reflects the uh, mean annual temperature. Okay, As you go down in the annual precipitation but you still have a, a very low uh, prevent uh, a very low uh, evapotranspiration you will go through from rainforest into um, dry forest into temperate rainforest okay up into boreal forest and so on and that can be reflected in different altitudinal belts and also latitudinal regions. We're more concerned with the tropical regions that we've got down the bottom. Okay, As you move from high rainfalls to low rainfall, so low rainfall is 125 millimeters or below, you go from rainforest to wet forest to moist forest to subhumid forest to semi-arid forest, arid forest, per-arid forest or very arid forest and then super-arid forest. So super-arid scrub or ecosystem and so on. Trinidad would sit around 2,000 millimeters and it's in the tropics so Trinidad would have moist forest to dry forest under the uh, Holdridge classification. Okay. This is another means of representing ecosystem type based on mean annual precipitation and mean annual temperature. Okay. If we have mean annual precipitation of around 2000 as we have for Trinidad and mean annual temperature which would be around 28 degrees or so. This particular system would show, um, show that uh, Trinidad would have a tropical seasonal forest. Okay, So that forest would show some deciduousness but not the complete deciduousness that you would get in a tropical dry forest. 
and at the upper boundary of precipitation that would be pretty much the same as tropical rainforest and at the lower boundary it would be a, a tropical uh, dry forest or tropical woodland okay and even savanna as well the in Trinidad we have that range we have areas which are over 250 millimeters on the east coast and areas like around Port of Spain where the average annual precipitation is around 1300 millimeters so we get a range of forests from tropical rainforest on the east coast and up in the northern range down to tropical dry forest around Port of Spain at sea level okay. so we can say that tropical uh, rainforests occur in areas of the tropics where the rainfall seasonality is at a minimum if you have more than three months of the year with um, that should be less than more than three months of the year with less than 50 millimeters of rainfall there tends to be no rainforest okay there you would have uh, deciduous dry forest and deciduous scrub and savanna so the seasonality of the rainfall is a big influence on the type of um, uh, type of ecosystem that you get okay now I just want you to consider the Caribbean and the Caribbean islands when we look up the islands to say an island like Dominica which is at around I guess 15 degrees north of the equator um, it's getting up there and yet Dominica is known for its lush tropical rainforests and yet it has a fairly large seasonality of rainfall probably more than three months of the year uh, would have less than 50 millimeters so why is it that say Dominica and say St Lucia, St Vincent, uh, Guadeloupe um, even places like Montserrat would tend to have rainforests and known for their rainforest they're in that zone of seasonality which is uh, much higher than would should support a rainforest and then when you go up further to um, the Lesser Antilles the the um, windwards you would find the leewards sorry you would find islands like Antigua Aruba which have a reputation for being very dry no rainforest there you would tend to find either dry deciduous forest or you would find scrub desert scrub so what what is the difference between those two islands for well, those of you who've done um, who have done uh, Caribbean island ecology will know of course that the main difference between those islands is relief okay the islands which can carry rainfall tend to be much taller they have mountains and that can have a big impact by providing a different type of rainfall during the dry season when convectional rainfall fails and we're going to talk about that a little bit in a minute after we look at wind in the tropics because it is with that wind that you get uh, this type of rainfall called orographic rainfall so let's talk about wind in the tropics so when I talk about wind in the tropics say in, for instance in Trinidad one of the first things that you think about are the trade winds of course and the trade winds blow from the northeast uh, to the southwest so that means we get a prevailing wind in Trinidad from the east, from the northeast in particular, from out across the Atlantic Ocean, across the island of Trinidad. Okay, so why do we get these trade winds? What is the origin of the trade winds? Well, the origin of the trade winds has a lot to do with that evaporation 
of um, air of moisture and sorry the heating of the air and the evaporation of the moisture which occurs when the sun is directly overhead and which occurs at a particularly high rate around the equator all that air mass rising and just continually rising rises every day all that air has to go somewhere okay and it does if we look at a diagram all that heated up air at the equator and this is a stylized representation that heated up air may move to the north and move to the south during the different um, times of the year when the sun is overhead at different times of the year but during that time the energy is at maximum so the air rises and it rises more or less continuously pausing at night but each day rising so it has to go somewhere so where does it go it spreads it, once it reaches its um, position of buoyancy in the atmosphere it will tend to travel and it will be forced out of the way by uh, more air rising behind it and it will travel through the upper, upper atmosphere until it reaches a point where it is cool enough and uh, the air underneath it is cool enough and it will subside okay it'll also it also can encounter um, winds coming from the opposite direction okay so it's cool enough and the air most importantly the air underneath it is cool enough so it is able to subside so some of this air will subside a lot of um, looks like a, a lot of the air will continue at this high altitude all the way up to the poles before it comes back down again so when this uh, air descends and this where it descends is actually at the tropic regions okay so the air will rise at the equator travel through the upper atmosphere and when it gets cool enough and the air underneath it gets cool enough it will descend okay and that where it descends the zone of where it descends is usually around 30 degrees north and south of the equator so slightly north of the tropic lines okay so all of that air being pumped up into the atmosphere traveling along and then descending it has to go somewhere okay and that's where this diagram comes in where the area where it d is descending okay is 30 degrees north and south so that forms an area of high pressure at the surface of the earth okay as the air is piled down on top of uh, the line along 30 degrees north and south so that area of high pressure the wind will blow from the area of high pressure to areas of low pressure on the surface of the earth and as you can imagine the area of the equator because of that constant heating and evaporating and rising of air will be an area of low pressure and so the winds will blow from the tropic regions to the equator okay now if the earth was stationary if it did not rotate on its axis the wind would blow directly take the shortest route from the tropic lines to the equator okay but the earth is rotating and because the earth is rotating it means that the winds are deflected to blow in a westerly direction okay the reason for that is because the uh, the earth rotates from east to west okay not only does the earth rotate from east to west okay but because um, at the circumference of the earth at the equator okay uh, the surface of the earth 
has to travel at a much faster speed to keep up with all the other points on the surface of the Earth. So the surface of the Earth is spinning very rapidly at the equator, but it is almost stationary at the poles, at the axis of this rotation. Okay? And everywhere in between okay, is intermediate and it's getting faster. It just gets faster and faster the closer you get to the equator until it's at the maximum there. So people use this property when they are launching rockets into space. If they launch a rocket into space there, there is no centripetal force to help the rocket get up into orbit. But if you launch close to the equator, there's a quite a strong centripetal force because the Earth, that's where the Earth is spinning fastest. And the rocket would spend less energy to get up into orbit. Okay? That's why America launches from Florida um, and the Europeans have a base in French Guiana to launch their rockets. Okay? You use less fuel to get up into the atmosphere. All right. If the Earth is spinning at a slower speed around 30 degrees north of the equator and a faster speed at the equator, then that air uh, will tend to be deflected because it needs to try and catch up as it blows from 30 degrees across to the equator. Okay, so instead of going straight down, it is dragged by the surface of the Earth, which is rotating underneath it, to the west. Okay, and that is why the trade winds, instead of blowing directly from north to south, are instead deflected from the east towards the west. And that is why in Trinidad we would tend to get the trade winds coming from the east. Okay? So the speed of the rotation of the surface of the earth at the equator is fastest. At 30 degrees it is uh, north of the equator it is slower. Because the air is being piled down on top of 30 degrees it has to go somewhere so it would go to the north and to the south we're just concerned about it the stuff which goes to the south the air which goes to the south if the earth wasn't rotating it would go straight from the high pressure zone to the low pressure zone but because the earth is rotating and at unequal speeds it's faster at the equator slower at 30 degrees the uh, air has to try and catch up to end um, the faster rotation at the equator deflects that moving air to the west and that's why we perceive our trade winds blowing from the east okay so that means we have um, uh, the trade winds okay blowing from the east and that has an important effect on the distribution of rainfall throughout the year particularly on the eastern edges of continents and the eastern edges of islands and it is one of the reasons why rainfall in Trinidad is much higher on the eastern coast compared to the western coast okay on the eastern coast of Trinidad sorry let's talk more about uh, first of the about the western coast of Trinidad the western coast of Trinidad will tend only to get its rainfall from convectional sources. The eastern coast of Trinidad, so it would only get rainfall when the energy is high enough for thunderstorms to form and drop convectional rainfall. On the eastern coast of Trinidad, however, during the periods of the year when convectional rainfall is not generated, trade winds would blow from across the ocean and scoop together all the moisture and concentrate it. So when it reaches land, it is at a high enough humidity to interact with the moisture coming off the forest to form rainfall. 
okay it's not as much rainfall it's not very much compared to the convectional rainfall but it's enough to bring rainfall to the eastern sides of these islands and the eastern sides of these continents so you would tend to get a strip of rainforests at sea level all along the eastern edges of continents and you would tend to find that sort of um, rainforest at least up to 10 maybe 15 degrees north of the equator at sea level Trinidad is right at the boundary once you get further north there simply isn't enough um, rainfall at sea level so you would tend to get more deciduous and stunted ecosystems even on the east coast of the islands however there is another factor which comes into play and that is relief relief influences rainfall by forcing those trade winds upwards so the trade winds are deflected upwards now who cares you say so the trade winds are forced upwards if they're forced upwards they will tend to cool down okay this is at a at a ada biotic cooling okay as altitude increases temperature decreases 1.5 degrees centigrade for every 350 meters increase in altitude so uh, Mont Bleu is about 800 meters high so it would have a average annual temperature which is about three maybe four degrees lower than the average annual temperature in say St. Augustine and you can really feel that difference when you go up Mont Bleu it does feel much cooler now the reason for this cooling effect is because there's less atmosphere as the higher you go up okay if there's less atmosphere the higher you go up there's less pressure on the air bodies and therefore it expands and gets cooler okay so winds then as they are deflected up over the top of mountains they are made to rise the pressure on them gets lower and they would expand and cool down as they expand and cool down there's less energy in them and if there's less energy in them the water vapor will condense and much like um, convectional rainfall as it is forced up the water condenses okay around dust particles and forms those clouds okay and you get precipitation so on the eastern sides of islands which are tall and have mountains up to you know 800 500 meters I think the effect start would start at different places um, as you go further north you would have to go slightly higher um, if you go inside continents or the mountains are smaller the effect would start lower okay as temperature decreases condensation and precipitation increases the condensation and precipitation cause clouds and mist to form on mo on most days even during the dry season this is known as orographic rainfall okay and this is the reason why you would tend to get rainfall as you go up the islands even though there is long periods of the year when there is simply no uh, rainfall sorry no convectional rainfall so such rainfall the orographic rainfall supports the rainfall when convectional rainfall fails in the winter and that is why we would get rainforest on these volcanic mountainous Caribbean islands and we don't get any rainfall on the islands which are flat like Antigua and Aruba okay and all of this is because of the trade winds which come from the east and they interact with the north-south trending uplands on these islands okay what more do I want to talk to you about
Okay, size matters. The size of the mountain does matter. Um, bigger mountains will tend to hold more heat. They store up heat like a big heat sink. So temperatures tend to be higher at a given altitude on a larger mountain. So the northern range here is uh, considered a fairly small um, range of mountains. The coastal range in Venezuela are much bigger, okay, particularly behind, in front of Caracas there. So we would start to get that condensation at a much higher altitude that, uh, on a bigger mountain because there's more heat around than say here in Trinidad. So we would tend to find the rainforest down to a lower level here in Trinidad compared to Venezuela where the rainforest would start to come in at a higher level because the clouds would be formed by the orographic processes at a higher level. And this is known as the Masna-Hibung effect. Great name. I always love to include that. So coastal mountains have um, more constant maritime temperatures. They experience more humidity, more cloud and rainfall, and the ecosystem zones, the rainforests, tend to be shifted downwards. So you would tend to find rainforests at lower altitudes than you would expect, say, in a um, non-coastal, more continental location. Okay? So, we would tend to then therefore find different ecosystems at different parts of the tropics. Lowland tropical rainforests we would tend to find where convectional rainfall occurs throughout the year within 5 degrees north and south of the equator or in areas where um, orographic rainfall or uh, the trade winds gather enough moisture together to supplement the absent um, convectional rainfall during the dry season. So that would be places like the eastern coast of Trinidad. So you would get rainforest even at sea level on the eastern coast of Trinidad because the trade winds gathers together the moisture enough to form rainfall during the dry season. As you f go further north from Trinidad, um, imagine Tobago, Little Tobago Island is quite dry. Their trade winds don't gather enough moisture together during the dry season and you have to go up an altitude to get the orographic rainfall before you would start to get rainforests. There's enough rainfall throughout the year. You would tend to get tropical dry forests in those areas where there is enough rainfall but not enough rainfall to maintain a green photosynthetic canopy throughout the year. Okay. And these would be the evergreen forests uh, in the low, um, sorry, where you would have convectional rainfall throughout the year uh, or with uh, supplemented with orographic rainfall. Montane forests um, tend to occur at the tops of mountains for two reasons. First of all, for the orographic rainfall, but also secondly, because the temperature is cooler, there's less of a photosynthetic, uh, sorry, a evapotranspiration load on the vegetation. So it's always cooler, so there's less evaporation. So the plants can keep their stomata open longer and therefore retain their leaves longer. Okay, so you go further up, it starts to get a bit too cold and also the amount of clouds which form is too persistent. So every day there is clouds and that begins to reduce the amount of sunlight which plants need to grow. And so they become stunted. Okay, So it's too much of a good thing. The clouds are too much of a good thing and they begin to block the amount of sunlight and therefore reduce the amount of photosynthesis by that means. And once you get high enough, you're going to get frosts every evening, every night you would get a frost. Okay? And also you're going to be above a cloud line, so all the moisture is dropped during condensation at lower altitudes. And so you would 
the air at the, the top is going to be cooler, uh, sorry, uh, drier. And because of that, you would get alpine shrublands or grasslands. Trees cannot grow. There's not enough moisture and it's too cold to grow. Okay, and those would be the alpine shrublands or grasslands called the Paramo or the Puna in the Andes in South America. We don't have alpine shrublands or grasslands in Trinidad. The mountains simply aren't high enough. Uh, the coastal range of Venezuela also doesn't have these. It's only when you get into the Andes of Venezuela that you would start to get the Paramo. That's, that's above no, probably above 3,000 meters above sea level. The last thing that I want to talk to you about are rain shadows. Once this wind has been forced up and it's dropped all its moisture over the mountains, they're considerably drier. And that, coupled with the fact that the winds would be descending on the other side of these mountain ranges, and as they descend, they get more pressure on them, they get more compressed, and they heat up. And that means they have a greater capacity for sucking up moisture in them. Okay? So the winds which pass up over mountains and descend once again become almost like sponges sucking the moisture up. So there are no clouds. Okay? And much reduced rainfall. Okay, particularly during the dry season when there is no convectional rainfall. These are known as the rain shadow areas and they occur on the western, southwestern sides of hills and mountains. And that's why you would tend to find the drier scrub ecosystems in the Lesser Antilles on the eastern and southern sides of these mountains. It's a rain shadow effect. All the moisture which has been dumped in the rainforest in the mountainous interiors uh, does not make it down into the southern and western sides of the islands. And you get a rain shadow effect where there is even less rainfall than you would find on the uh, eastern sides of these islands at sea level. Okay, we see a rain shadow effect around Port of Spain and down the islands, Shakishikari and so on, because the moisture has been sucked out of the trade winds by the northern range. And we see this most developed um, around in Venezuela on the uh, western end of the coast range, which starts in the Paria Peninsula. And around the town of Cumaná, there is more or less a desert, cactus and all of that. Okay, well there's an introduction to why we get the different ecosystems in different places. Um, hopefully now you understand why we would tend to get rainforests in the Caribbean where we do. Okay, read the references and um, have fun. Bye.